Abanigani, everyone. This is Professor Amin Ra, Professor Emeritus, California State University, now African Studies, formerly Black Studies, uh, former city councilman for the city of Compton, former Compton College Board of Trustee and Compton Unified School District Board of Three, my uh, Board of uh, Trustees. Um, my uh, co host is Brother Historian Joe Hinrich, longtime educator, coach, and a uh, researcher of Black history and Black culture, and uh, uh, outstanding educator, as well as a college, I'm a high school administrator. He'll be joining us shortly. Uh, our guest tonight is uh, a good friend, a, a person that we've blazed the trail of uh, Cal State Long Beach. Uh, we uh, fought many demonstrations of police abuse. Uh, most notably was the Denifu Kareem now and uh, Irvin Hakeem uh, ambushed by the police department. Uh, we, we ran a committee and, 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 and demonstrated with regards to the injustice and the uh, trumped up charges the police gave on them. Uh, they shot Irvin in the back and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, Bobby is an author, author of uh, two books, two award-winning recognized books. Uh, one is the history of Compton. And the other one is um, notable Southern California personalities uh, you know, in, in Southern California. And we're looking forward to uh, him discussing those books and any other issue that he would like to bring up because uh, he's a person that's battlefield tested. I mean, he was on the front line with many uh, relationships with various organizations and uh, uh, one of the leaders of the black culture and black power movement of the 60s all the way up to the 70s, the 80s. So without further delay, I'm gonna let uh, Brother Bobby tell you a little bit more about his, uh, who he is and what he's been doing. And then we'll get into him uh, talking about why he wrote these two books and what he think we should get out of those two different books. So Bobby, it's on you. Robert. Robert, you know, Robert B. Johnson. I'm sorry. You know, brother, you can you can still call me Bobby because when we met, when we knew each other uh, earlier, man, that's that's who I was. I was Bobby Lee Johnson. I just got older. That's all. <laughs> you know, um, you you know you you know I like to tell the story about how we met, right? <laughs> look here, look here, y'all. Look, you know, I was I was uh, I was new. I was just up at Cal State Long Beach. I'm feeling my oats. Somebody had asked me um, um, to read a poem, and um, Black Student Union, you know, had been quiet for a while. So uh, uh, somebody, I talked to somebody from EOP, and they were putting on a program, and it was right in front of the Humanities Building. So they got me to read the last poets, "The White Man's Got a God Complex." Never forget that poem. Yeah. So I'm standing out there. And I'm, you know, I'm just laying it down real tough and I'm, I'm having a ball doing it, right? Um, and a bunch of white folks, these white guys started moving towards the front of the crowd. And they didn't have no happy look on their face. But I was still trying to, you know, to spit out, you know, uh, the poetry. But I was seeing what was happening in front of me. So in my mind, I'm thinking like, Okay, I'm gonna get out of this because the steps were behind me. And I had this podium, and all I could think because I was I was uh, up above them a little bit, all I could think of was I was gonna have to pick up that podium and toss it at them and see if I could get out of there. All of a sudden, as they're walking toward, as they're coming towards me, they stopped. And they were looking, you know, because they, you know, people were looking at me because I was the speaker, but they were looking past me. And so, you know, I really quickly glanced over my shoulder and I see this big brother in this leather jacket and a stingy brim coming up behind me, looking like, uh, shoot, to me, he was looking like the cavalry brother, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Um, but you came up behind me and you was, you, was, you was looking like King Kong about to lay it down. And they froze, they stopped right there and then left. 
And, you know, I'm going like, well, who is this brother? And somebody said, that's, oh, man, that's Sleepy, man. That's, that's Sleepy Montgomery. I was like, yeah, that's how I first knew you. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking on my shoulder, and it was like, you pull my ass out to grease on that one. You know? You must be kind, brother. And, and, and I, I never forget that. You see what I'm saying? Because that's how I met you. That's when I first first yeah, heard of right. legendary Amon Ra. Because well, it was you know, like, <laughs> it was right right on time. <laughs> you, you know, I was Malcolm in the daytime and Superfly at night. Okay. So, <laughs> that's in the day. So we don't wake Sleepy up. Sleepy was wild. He was a wild oh, guy. That's what it looked like. It looked like you would just woke up and you was, you know, you weren't having it. And I was like, I'm, I'm glad he's on my side. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But anyway, you know, but it was right at that time, it was like that because, uh, you remember, you remember uh, Arnett Hartsfield? Yes. Arnett Hartsfield, even when I wasn't taking this class, I would come in and audit this class just because he was laying down that history. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was involved in, in the fight to integrate the fire department uh, over here in Los Angeles. A lot of that history I hadn't heard before because they were teaching it like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when I was in high school, I was at Compton High. Excuse me. My mom was working over at Compton College. Uh, they had a manpower class they were doing. My mom was involved with the city, uh, Model Cities program. And so she would have me come up there with her because she didn't want, you know, well, I think it was two things. She didn't want to be up there by herself at night and she wanted to keep an eye on me in the evening. Mm -hmm. So I was in high school. And eventually she just said, well, since you're here every night, why don't you take a class? And I took this class, remember it clear, that it was called the History of Mexico. And that was when I, you know, because I'm in high school getting the U.S. regular, the myth of America's history, you know, that that is commonly taught. But here I'm getting this college level course and they're telling me something that nobody had mentioned before that California was part of Mexico. Okay. So I'm like, okay, California was part of Mexico. And, you know, the next thing that blew my mind when, when they told me that, uh, as I'm studying this, that one of the first presidents of Mexico after, after uh, they threw off uh, Spain was a black man named Vicente Guerrero and he ended slavery in Mexico. Now that sounded like a better story to me than the Abraham Lincoln one, okay? Because this man had come from enslaved Africans and he rose to a position because he fought, he fought as a revolutionary and when their the government took over from Spain, you know, he becomes president. And the first thing he does is freeze, freeze the, the slaves in the 1820s. So I'm like, how come I'm not learning about this? It always stuck in my head that at that time, being that young, just understanding that there were huge chunks of information that were not being disseminated, that we were being told a different story. Because it was like, I'm, I'm getting history in my high school in the daytime. I'm at Compton College at night and I'm getting this, this class history in Mexico that's telling me a lot different. And it started, things started making sense. You know, one, why are there so many Mexicans? Two, you know, the names of the cities and the streets. And then you start to kind of understand, well, oh, so this is my actual environment, you know? So what, so what else have they not told me? You see what I'm saying? That's, that's when I was, I, I just became curious about things. We were already getting the whole idea about un, trying to understand our role in society based on our history. Well, obviously I got to the point where I realized that, that I, as I figured my personal role was rebellion, you know? was, and, and not just childish infantile rebellion for rebellion's sake, you know, that you think about with teenagers and everything, but the idea that I'm rebelling against the lies that I'm, the obvious lies that I'm being told and I'm searching for the truth. And every conscious person that I've met, that I talk to, the first thing that they come up with 
and even in your classes and, and with Arnett Hartsfield, everybody was searching for the truth of the thing. You know, because we we recognize the lie. Because you know, it's like the day when you wake up and you say, you know, these these things are not making sense. So I looked at that's that's that was my initial contradiction. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what radicalized me though, when um, I became a uh, community worker at the Black Panther Party in the early '70s, uh, working in the breakfast program. When 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 the Black Panther Party had moved the headquarters to Compton over on Stockwell. But the thing that radicalized me was December second, nineteen seventy two, when the police killed a, a, a member of my community, like a young girl who lived just a, you know, two blocks down. I went to school with her brothers, uh, uh, Keith and Cecil Faust. Uh, Marquita Faust was gunned down by the sheriff on December 2nd, 1972. And what had happened was, and, and, and one I'm thinking, she's like 13, 14 years old, okay? And for those of you who don't know, um, David Blake, uh, most people know him as DJ Quick. That was his older sister, okay? But his older brothers, Keith and uh, Cecil, I went, I went to school with. They were classmates of mine. And at the time, you know, they were, you know, they, they were doing some things, you know, stealing cars and such. But um, in this particular time, the police is chasing a stolen car that comes into the neighborhood uh, pulls up right there on Spruce Street and, and two guys jump out and run. The cops don't even realize, you know, they, they assume that they're chasing either Keith or Cecil uh, and, they, and they kick in the side door of uh, their house. The car was parked, you know, right next to their home. So the two guys who ran away, you know, they get away, but they kick into the house because they, they're thinking that uh, it's, it's these two guys who live there they kick in the door, they're not even home. There are only two people in the house, a uh, Marquita, who's like I said, 13, 14 years old, and uh, her mother. So her mother, you know, is, is screaming like, you know, what, you know, of course, like anybody would do, you know, what are you doing in my house? Okay, and they're trying to claim hot pursuit, but they were saying there's nobody here. The people you're looking for are not here. So they go about to arrest her. And since she doesn't, you know, see how it makes any sense why she should be arrested when these guys are kicked in her door, she's resisting. So they're brutalizing her mother. She's watching this. They take her outside and with all the yelling and the police, people in the neighborhood now have come out. Um, Gary Pierfoy uh, lived across the street. Other, other people, uh, uh, there was a sister, uh, 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 Elaine Brown uh, lived on that street. Um, and, her, and, and her sister, uh, uh, Fern, uh, several other people, you know, came out and by now they got a crowd. So the police, they do two things. They form a perimeter to keep people, you know, keep the crowd out. They basically put everybody on that block, into the block under house arrest. And they even, when they form their perimeter, they don't let the Compton police in. It's just sheriff. And basically the people who were, you know, were locked down at gunpoint from the sheriff. People uh, said how uh, they saw the, the sheriff moving the car, you know, the, the stolen car that they, they backed it up a little so that it was a little more in front of uh, um, uh, uh, the house that they kicked the door in. So I'm looking at all this and this is like the second time I've seen, I saw Compton police shoot, shoot down some guy who, who had, uh, some guys had just robbed some place they were chasing them down uh, Wilmington. And uh, they ran their car into a pole. A couple of guys started running and uh, this one cop just bam on one knee and start and shot this cat in the back. And uh, so, so now this other thing, I didn't actually you know, see when Marquita was, was shot, but you know, it's like somebody you knew that you saw all the time. Uh, you, you knew her brother, you knew her family. So the community came out. There were uh, brothers who, who went door to door, 
just old fashioned organizing, door to door. You know, this is what happened in the community. You know, they had arrested uh, Mrs. Fowler, they had arrested her and charged her with murder. So uh, we formed a committee, and the first job of the committee was, was to raise money to get her out of jail. Okay. Eventually, they dropped charges against her. But there was nothing, as you probably already guessed, you know, there was nothing done to the uh, police officers. Now, my big contradiction in that was that the officer who fired the shot that killed her, because without the, 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 there were two cops, a black cop and a white cop. The white cop was brutalizing the mother and he had uh, his, his sidearm had fallen out of the holster. And Marquita bent down like she was going to pick up the gun and uh, the Negro officer shot her. Hmm. So that was a, that was a contradiction. Well, this this was, was a black man shot this little black girl. And at the time, the only organization who who helped helped me understand that contradiction was the Black Panther Party. So I ended up joining. So, you know, that that was that was the point of my radicalization. I ended up working, you know, we, we formed the Coalition Against Police Abuse uh, later, uh, Michael Zinzin and, and a lot of other folks. Um, Karen Bass, Karen Bass was part of that. And um, because, what, you know, once you start, we started going to these justice meetings, we'd go to different events, you start noticing that the majority of the people were there with justice committees, okay, defense committees, where their loved ones had been killed by the police and they formed a committee to try to get justice. So, so what ends up happening is we figure that you don't need 25 people doing different things. It might make sense if we kind of form an umbrella organization. And that's how the coalition against police abuse came about. Okay, Rob, I have a question. Yes, sir. You were saying that's uh, DJ Quick, sister that got killed? Yes. Okay, is that in the same, because he, as far as I know, he grew up in my neighborhood. Is that uh, like a, a Ramby uh, by Dixon Elementary and all of that? Yeah, Spruce Street. Oh, Spruce, okay. Yeah, yeah that's right. I was on, I grew up on Palmer. So are you a, did you grow up in the neighborhood with us? I, I grew up on Cedar Street, 400 block. Cedar? Yeah. Oh, man. Wait a minute. Curtis? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see. Is, is that the street right by Dickerson? I'm... It's uh, it's it's on the, it would be on the south side of Dickerson, where that, that street is Cedar. Okay. Yeah. Okay, where you can go straight up the street and go right into Davis. Okay, that's Cedar Cedar Street. Okay, you have what, um, you got spruce, maple, and then cedar. Okay, see, I'm on Palmer. You Now, what year you come out of Compton High? I came out in 73. Oh, you know my brother Reggie. I probably do. Reggie Smith that ran track? Was yeah. the SB president? That's yeah. That's my brother. Yeah, that's my brother and Troy Smith and Shelly Smith. Oh, man, you know, um, we went to, uh, I rolled with your brother to the prom. <laughs> yeah, because he was work, you know he was working at that liquor store um at Gus. Uh, yeah, at Gus Liquor Store. He was working there and the owners let them use his car. Okay. Wow. And uh and we went uh we went to the prom in 72. That's something. He, he went with Sumi Gat. Okay, so now Brother Machinda, he grew up right right a couple of houses down from me. And he might know you. I don't know. Hey, Brother Machinda. What's up? How you doing? All right. And so did you know Bobby Johnson? Uh, he grew up right there on Cedar. He came out in 73 with Reggie. No. He, no, okay. Well, he, yeah, that's the guest tonight. So he's he's from my neighborhood. Okay. You that's have a amazing. Sister, you, you have a sister named Cherokee, right? 
Yeah, that's my little sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. That's why. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I've been over your house, man. Come on. <laughs> I, 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 you know what? You do look familiar. You remind me of Phil, Phil Valentine. But <laughs> yeah, you do look familiar. Okay. Yeah, when, you're, when your brother had that little v, uh, uh, VW, we'd be riding around in that. Okay. <laughs> All I was, right. See, I was supposed to come out in 74, but I graduated early. I came out December 73. Amazing. Okay, I'll let you get back. <laughs> but yeah, but I'm gonna tell you something. You went to Davis, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna tell you, man. When and and this is what formed a lot of people. In 1970, General Benjamin O. Davis came to the school. Okay. Mm -hmm. I and think. Yeah. Yeah, I, think I heard I, I, that. I didn't know anything about the Tuskegee Airmen. Okay, I didn't know anything about the Tuskegee Airmen, but here comes the the guy that they named the school after. You know, I'm just a kid. I'm 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 sitting around and and uh, we had an assembly, and I'm talking about this. This is this was the most impressive brother outside of my father that I ever met. Okay, he came in his general uniform. He was ramrod straight. This was Benjamin O. Davis looking like you know this is excellence. You know, incarnate. Mm. And so, um, I mean, he came in, he was very generous with his time. He talked to us, you know, shook our hands, looked us in the eye and made me want to find out who the Tuskegee Airmen were. See, all these things were opening, just opening up to me. This is junior high school, you see what I'm saying? We had a field trip to the Dominguez Adobe. Okay, because I was, you know, and this is, this is before I went to the, to Compton College and took that class. Um, I go to the Dominguez Adobe, and I'm understanding that this one Dominguez family owned basically the South Bay. And of course, my question was, what happened? And it took me over years to figure out exactly what happened, because most of the Californios, you know, even though, you know, because there was no uh, a Black consciousness movement or anything at that time, even though most of them had African roots, such as like P.O. Pico and, and um, uh, uh, Manuel Nieto, which, who, who owned all the land on the uh, east side of the, Los of, of the Los Angeles River, all the way through Long Beach, um, uh, Rancho uh, Los Altos. I mean, these large swashes yeah. of land. And you're going, well, how did they lose that? And that made me go back to the conquest of California of the Southwest by the United States. Most people don't talk about the Mexican-American War, okay? That was a war for manifest destiny. And one of the things through my research as I'm looking at everything, I'm, I'm, there's the Treaty of Kauai. If you ever go to um, Universal Studios, directly in front, right across the street from Universal Studios, there's, there's um, a reconstructed adobe. It was originally um, called, a, it was Coanga Adobe. That's where they signed the capitulation that ended the fighting in California. Not the whole Mexican-American war, just the fighting in California. And the two people who signed it was, it was General Andreas Pico, the brother of the, of, of the governor, uh, Pio Pico, and Colonel John Fremont. They had a negotiated peace, basically. Basically, the 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 uh, U.S. Army said, "If you stop shooting at us, you know, we'll leave you alone." But in that treaty, it told them a couple of things. It said, "You can keep your land, and you could keep your language." Okay. And that became a problem later because you know the forty nine because this is eighteen forty seven, you know the forty ers end up coming for the gold. You get. I mean, well, one, you got to think about the, the population in the whole state of California, California wise, was probably, you know, 20 to 50,000 people. In a matter of just a year or so, you had over 100,000 settlers, okay, white folks coming from the East Coast searching for gold and prosperity coming within a year. So they overpowered the, by population, the indigenous population, okay. Uh, well, I shouldn't say indigenous because the, the, the Spanish took it from, from the indigenous uh, population. 
but um, they get overrun. So one of the things they had to do was figure out, and this, this was um, the first two senators um, to represent California were, uh, or of course, uh, uh, Colonel Fremont, he became a US Senator from California. And, um, oh man, what's his name? William, um, come to me. anyway, um, the second guy, I can't call his name right now. He had been a politician in Mississippi and had come to California. And he's the one who came up with the racially restricted laws, okay? Uh, Burnett, who was the governor, was famous for coming up with uh, with the law that banned black people out of Oregon. Basically told him, you know, that Oregon, you know, if you're black, you don't even bother to come. And if you're already here, uh, you better leave. If we find you, the, I think the, the first offense was 20 lashes. Second offense was like 40 lashes, something like that. So they were trying to, you know, the whole ethnic cleansing thing very early on. Anyway, um, Burnett and the Senator, William, who I can't think of his last name right now. Um, they start with a raft of basically uh, a racially uh, suppressed, racially suppressive laws. They come up with the law that says black folks cannot, cannot um, um, engage a, a white person in court. Now that makes it really easy to start taking people's lands if you can't take the white people to court. But they do that right away. They disenfranchise, you know, uh, the black uh, Indian mestizo population. Makes it easy to run everything, and they still call it a democracy. Okay, so when you understand what was going on in 1850, that's when you start to understand. It's like, wait a minute. The nail in the coffin was when they turned around and, and formed a a land commission, and the land commission was made up of three of the settlers, okay? Three white men. And they basically told everybody, look, prove to us that you own the land, that your family has been on for generations, but prove to us you own it. And you have to keep in mind that a lot of parchment, you know, parchment, uh, you know, made out of um, um, cattle skin, you know, when they skin the, uh, the cattle. so. So it's organic, so it'll age and it'll crumble, okay? Paper, paper was at a premium. So some people, you know, it's like they couldn't put hands on the, on the, um, on the proclamation that where they got that land grant or how they got it. And if you couldn't do that, you couldn't prove you own the land, then they took the land and sold it at auction, okay? But the thing is, the trick was the onus was on the landowner to prove they own the land. Thanks for that. Go ahead. I want you to, uh, uh, first of all, I'm gonna see if uh, anybody else have any questions. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure if uh, uh, Mr. Hendrick, uh, uh, I thought he was at Davis for a little while. Uh, Joe, you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, hey, hey, brother, appreciate your presentation. Thank uh, you. I, I know, uh, I know another Bobby Johnson. I thought you might have been him. He used to be a pitcher at Compton High School. He might have been a year ahead of you. He was like seventy-two, I think. His name is Bobby Johnson, also. Yeah, he's 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 down in Atlanta. Hey. His brother, his brother Lewis. He got a brother named Lewis. Live on Central Avenue. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was a funny thing, man. At Compton High School, whenever I get called to the to the office, you know, get called to the principal's office over the loudspeaker, they say Robert Johnson, you know, to the principal's office. Four of us would always show up. <laughs> yeah, I was, was just hoping he didn't want me because we 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 had Aaron Aaron C. Wade was our principal. Always had me in his office back during my time. Matter of fact, the year after I graduated, they was getting ready for the graduation. This is what people tell me. He got on the loudspeaker and said, "Let's not have no more Joe Hembricks at graduation." But anyway, uh, yeah, man, I got a similar 
uh, uh, awakening, you know, like you did. I used to live around all white folks before I moved to Compton. Mm -hmm. Back to a class where I came from. But anyway, I remember riding on the back of the truck with the furniture going down central, seeing all these black people. I was like, man, never seen that before in my life. But anyway, uh, I was a history major in college and uh, I didn't know nothing, just like all of us until we get that awakening. So once I find I had been teaching, yeah, you know, there was a little stuff I knew about the blackness of, you know, how, uh, you know, how LA used to be in P.O. Pico and, and the John C. Fremont store. You know, Fremont took whole California with just 50 cowboys. They weren't even military, they were just cowboys. And the only thing they took was these missions because the missions were not even, you know, guarded by any military. They're just a bunch of Native Americans that uh, uh, Father Sarah and them had been brutalizing for years. Well, you know, they 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 had they had uh, put presidios next to some of the major um, missions. And as you mentioned that, I mean, you know, we. What, what was happening to the to the indigenous people in with these missions, man, was was very was very akin to slavery. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You know, and um, you know when I would first do my research, I'd go up to Santa Barbara, and they had all these little crosses all through all through the uh, uh, the back of the mission, and you know where where uh, some of the indigenous people who had worked there died. They took those out because it looked like just what it was a graveyard. So they kind of clean out. If you go up there today, they don't they don't have it like that anymore. Now they have like like a a, a mausoleum on one end. So there's always you know we we have to watch it because I mean we see nationally what they're trying to do. They're trying to sweep everything under the rug. But that's not new. That's what they've always tried to do. This isn't a, a an attack against critical race theory. You know, have these people in law school trying to you know uh, deal with that issue. It's an attack against black studies, period. That's what they're really, and they've always gone after it. They would rather teach the American myth than the American truth, because the American truth doesn't jive with, with the, with the uh, conversation. You know, um, look, they, they, signed, they signed the um, Voting Rights Act in what, 64? 65, thank you. I uh, always make sure to the 65, okay, 65, uh, Civil Rights Act 64. Um, so if we had to wait to 64, and then I, you look in history and you see, well, wait a minute, they, they, they gave us that right, right out, right in the 1860s. So why we had to do it again? See, because if it's a privilege, they can take it away from you. If it's a right, then it's supposed to be a right. Don't play with me, you know, and then take it away from me for a hundred years and then say, oh, we're giving you something that you had before. So keep in mind that even during that time when black people could not vote, I mean, were violently opposed, you know, being opposed on the streets, if you tried to vote, they still called it a democracy. Well, you know, Bobby, a lot of that was because uh, the, the Civil Rights Act was for many uh, black people were in major numbers in the South during that period. Mm -hmm. And uh, in certain little areas, they outnumbered the whites. Yes. And so, so and for my, and in California, they let blacks vote because the whites outvoted, the, the whites had the majority. Wherever they're the majority, they'll let you vote because it's, it's nullified. But when, when, when they're a minority, like in South Africa, white folks was a minority, but yeah. they wouldn't let the blacks vote, who was the majority. And that's the same thing that's going on with voter suppression in Georgia and all of that. But let me get, let, let Joe and y'all go ahead back with your point. I just wanted to throw that out there. Oh no, I just want I just wanted to say on 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 that end. That's why we saw at the uh, end of the Mexican American War. What was the first thing they did? They disenfranchised non-white people because like you just said, they were in the minority. They were coming, you know, the, can you imagine the, you know, once they had the armies that came through and, and, and took over California, those armies were withdrawn. And they just left, they just left a few people to run things. 
So when they put their administrators in, the sheriffs or whatever, they were outnumbered by the people. But as the years changed, and it was rather quickly, because the you know they were bringing out, like I said, hundred thousand people come out in one year, and then you start then you started seeing things tip. You saw you saw less non-white officials, because even P.O. Pico had come back and they had elected him to the city council, you know. So it took them a little time to basically, what I'd like to say is there, there was a 30 year period where you saw a massive transfer of wealth. I'm talking about land from the 1850s, okay, to the 1880s. And it was, it was a done deal by the 1890s. Matter of fact, they celebrated, they, they had a festival, uh, uh, the Fiesta something where um, they were basically talking about the end of the Californios. So these things are, are systematic. And, and then we start to understand, you know, what, what, well, who got the wealth? See, when you transfer in land and everything, that, that comes out to wealth. Well, well, who got it? The wealth went from the hands of non-white people into the hands of white people. And it was, a series, it was done by taxes and by laws, by discriminatory laws. See, the way they came at you with the taxes is these were large land grants. You know, you, if you were, were, uh, were uh, Dominguez, you know, you had what, 144,000 uh, acres. Now, if they just even just say, we're gonna, you're gonna have a tax of a dollar an acre, he's, he's still in debt. These guys were, were, they were rich in land, but, but poor in cash, they were cash poor. So what did they have to do? They had to borrow. So where did they go to borrow? To the American banks that charged them from three to 5% per month. And you put up the deed to your land to get that when they when they were doing the um, the land commission, you had to prove you own the land. So you had to get a lawyer, you had to buy surveyors, you know, you had to put out money for that. And in order to put out money for that, you had to borrow money against your land. And if you didn't pay it back, you lost the land. It either went look. The city of Compton came about because um, Dominguez's favorite niece got married, she became a Ferrer, and and um, either he or his sister, you hear two different stories, uh, deeded 40, uh, 4,600 acres uh, to her as a Christ, as a, a wedding gift in the 1850s. By the 1860s, mid 1860s, she had lost the land. She had borrowed like $1,000. So she, she lost that 4,600 acres and it was put up to auction. Two land speculators bought the land, uh, uh, Temple and Gibson. Temple and Gibson sold the land to a uh, Methodist agricultural colony led by G.D. Compton, okay? Up in, they were in Stockton. So they bought the land and, and basically came down in, in the winter of, I think it was the winter of 67, and because uh, they ended up getting flooded out. But that's basically the beginnings of the city of Compton. 30 families from Stockton who do uh, Methodist um, agricultural collective. And they almost, they almost just left because like I said, they came in December, they got flooded out. There's no wood. You know, you have to go, you have to go to, uh, to the foothills to find wood. You know, we, we actually live in an arid area. We live on the edge of a desert. So it was a lot of scrub, very, not large trees. So they're looking, you know, they had put their little lean tos and everything up, you know, uh, scavenged their wagons and then they got flooded. You know, they, they were ready to hang GD Compton. You know, I'm sure that GD wasn't standing for, uh, you know, Griffith Dickinson, but he told the people to hang on. What they did is they fell back to what's now uh, Central and, um, and Alondra because that was the high ground. And, you know, he was telling them, you know, because they, they were a, uh, a church, you know, to hold on to God and, um, you know, let's see what happens as the water recedes. And as the water receded, you know, these families, some of them bought 40 acres, some of them had bought 80 acres or their farms. 
And so they came back and did their farm thing. And keep in mind, you have to keep this in mind. Some of their experiences have been on the plains. And the plains, it's like, you know, they used to call them sod busters because, you know, to, to, um, to make a, a, a row, you know, uh, for planting. I mean, that was work. You had to bust that sod. Not in Compton. It just turned over like, like a, a, a knife through hot butter. The land was very fertile. You know, we talk about how the Nile had made Egypt fertile, but the Los Angeles River had made all the areas surrounding Compton fertile because it, it, it was used to overflowing for eons, topsoil. So when these people finally did sit down and plant their, their crops, as I was reading through some of their diaries, that was the first time I heard Compton referred to as a paradise, okay? Most, most of the farmers were, were able to pay off their mortgages with their first harvest because that first harvest was so abundant. If you go through the records for the uh, LA County Fair, all up, up into the 1920s, when, when Compton was beginning to um, start, was starting to become a bedroom community, if you go through that, you will, you'll look and you'll see Compton always, was always number one for, for produce of uh, winning for their stock, things like that. It was a very agricultural community, a very white <laughs> agricultural community. It wasn't until after World War II that, that, that whole, the whole bedroom community really exploded. But you still had, you know, you, before World War II, you still had um, some people who were coming through, the population was low, but Compton was, was very Republican. It was very white. And um, by the 1950s, also very Mormon. Joe, you have any other issues? Oh, no. no. What about you, Machinda? Machinda, you still there? No, yeah. I, I don't. No, I'm just uh, enjoying the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Rasha T, you have any questions? I'm enjoying it also. It's good information. Yes. Well, I appreciate I appreciate y'all. Oh, hey, so, yeah, so if you look. So, so if you look at if you look at Compton, Compton's always been in the vanguard. You look, the first international air meet in 1910 is Compton. Now you'll see you'll see it might say uh, Los Angeles or Dominguez Hills because they had it at Dominguez Hills, but there was no such thing as Carson or Long Beach or Paramount. Paramount, you know, before it was Paramount, it was Clearwater. There was no such thing as none of that. Compton was the first city in the area. You know, it, it was actually, and here's the funny part, you know, because we all know now that Compton was the first black city here in California. We elected the first black mayor. He had a majority black city council, a majority black uh, uh, board of education. You know, that freaked a lot of people out, especially in 1969. But in 1888, Compton was the first white city in the area. Because most of the other outposts, Los Angeles, El Monte, those cities that were established had been established already under either Spanish or Mexican rule. So Compton, Compton just has an interesting history. But see, I like to compare Compton to Haiti. Haiti was the jewel of the French empire, colonial empire, okay? It was the wealthiest col uh, uh, colony they had spices and all that, all right? After the rebellion, after the slaves threw the slave masters out, they created boycotts. Matter of fact, I don't know if they're still doing it now, but I know up, at least up until World War II, Haiti was paying reparations to, um, to France and, and, and to uh, um, Great Britain. Now you hear all these people, every time we mention the reparations, they act like they don't understand you know, how that would work, but they sure did understand it when they were dealing with Haiti, okay? They drained the wealth of the place. They put, they had, they economically boycotted Haiti and destroyed any chance of them having an economy. And they went from, it went from the, the jewel of the empire to the most impoverished island, okay? In this hemisphere, Compton was the jewel of the area. Everything came out. That's why Compton had, had Compton College on, on the Compton High School campus. 
people ca came to Compton for an education. Compton High School uh, opens up what in the 1890s. Most people at that time only went to the ninth grade. When you wanted some higher education, you had to come to Compton or else, or else uh, there was another normal school in Los Angeles, but it was further out. So if you look in the Compton book, I, I have uh, a few of the black families who were at Compton High like in 1914, 1915, they came from Watts, okay? So they were living in Compton. So people, people would come from other places to Compton. Com After World War II, the attraction to Compton was the good houses and the good schools. The house I grew up in was built in 1947. My family moved into that house. We, we moved from, from uh, Watts, from Nickerson Gardens, uh, over here to, to uh, Cedar Street. And the house that, that, uh, that, that we moved into was built in 47. So the, so the housing stock wasn't that old at all. And that's what made a big difference. Now, what I do tell people, and, um, and like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, a, on another uh, book on uh, Watts Willowbrook. On Willowbrook in 1946, this enterprising black woman named Velma Grant really set the stage for black people to move into the west side of the Compton. She built the George Washington Carver Manor. Now you go over there on El, on El Segundo and, uh, and uh, Sanford, go down that street, that was right in the middle of what she built. Those houses were designed by Paul Williams. You can go through that neighborhood and you can see where her neighborhood ends and where others begin because of the designs of the homes. You know, those homes still look good well-designed homes. And of course, we all know Paul Williams, you know, he was designing um, homes for movie stars and everything else. But during World War II, he wrote two books on building small homes. And Velma had, had read those books and was able to talk him into uh, designing her homes. Because she had two watchwords, quality uh, workmanship, quality materials. She was offering for the first time because black people had been uh, blocked out of buying new housing stock because of racial uh, uh, racial covenants. This is 46. Racial covenants uh, aren't, aren't ruled unenforceable until 1948. Okay, then it's totally vacated in the early 50s. But this is 46, and she saw opportunity. She had been she um, had been in the real estate industry. And she saw all these black GIs were coming home with the um, um, GI Bill. And the GI Bill afforded them the ability to buy a home and to get an education, okay? But I'm gonna show you a little trickology that they use on it because we, you know, we, we look at it from our California lens and she saw the opportunity and she built those, whole, those homes for the, you know, veterans coming home and for the black middle class. But when they put out the GI Bill right after World War II, one of the things that FDR compromised in order to get it done because he had to satisfy the Southern Democrats. So what he did, well, what they demanded was that they said, look, we'll vote for this as long as we could, uh, we could administer um, the GI Bill locally. And what they were saying was we could would administer Jim Crow. Because if you were a soldier and you were returning to Alabama or Georgia or Louisiana, you're not getting a house on the GI Bill. You're not getting an education on the GI Bill. That was, that was the trick. Okay? So some states, California people were lucky to do that. And that that also increased why, you know, people, the, the great migration, you know, the first thing that started the great migration and a lot of us would look at our families and realize that they came just before World War II. You had Walter White from the NAACP, A. Philip Randolph. Uh, this is 1941. This is just before the war starts. June 41, 
they go to to FDR, A. Philip Randolph, um, and they say, look, we're gonna have a march on Washington unless you in, you know, do something about discrimination here at home. FDR was already criticizing Adolf Hitler for his treatment of the Jews, segregating them, and knowing that in fact, the Germans, the Nazis had gotten their template, okay, for persecuting the Jews from, from American Jim Crow. So he didn't want that, that international contradiction. He didn't want a big demonstration of black people saying we need to be free while they were busy telling everybody, well, we're the freedom fighters. So what he said is I'll make a deal with you. I will sign an executive order that will outlaw discrimination in anybody who's got a federal contract, which is basically the defense industry. And with that did, that was like ringing a de dinner bell because if you was a brother and you were down in, you know, butt fuck Mississippi, I, I'm sorry. If you were down in, in Mississippi somewhere and, and uh, behind your mule and you knew that no matter what job you had, you could never make the same money uh, that a white man could make, you know it was time to pack up and go someplace because now you knew if you worked in the defense industry that you were guaranteed to make the same money as everybody else. That was law. It wasn't like they weren't gonna stop calling you nigger and everything else, but it just meant that you could get the same pay. So that, that caused that second great migration to the North and to the West. And a lot of our families participated in that. So there, when we look at history, that we look at the wider things that affect us, but then we have to understand, look, whenever you, know, you, you think about like the unemployment insurance that came out of FDR's program, you know, there were certain, um, certain um, industries that were left out. If you were a domestic worker, if you were like a chauffeur or a maid, if you were a farm worker, you couldn't get unemployment. In those days, black people dominated those jobs. And those Southern senators were the ones that, uh, that said, look, if you want this to pass, this is how it has to be. Bobby. Yes, sir. What I, what I want you to do is, what do you want people to take from the history of Compton and uh, Southern, uh, Southern California notable people? What are some of the points you want to get from the book? And what was your motivation to write both of these books? Okay. I want people to understand that, um, that Black people have always been here in California. Even the very name California comes from a, a book about a mythical queen named Calafia, who was the, who was a queen of uh, over these Amazons, these black Amazon warrior women. Okay, that's where they even came up with the name. It was a, it was a very uh, popular book at the time. It was like how Star Wars is, and these um, mythical uh, uh, black women warriors were basically uh, living on an island called California. And so when Cortez and his guys got to uh, um, the Gulf of California, they could look over and they could see a, another piece of land. They thought that was an island of California. They thought it was an island out there. So Cal, that's how California got its name. And then I like to say, whenever I do a lecture, I always like to ask people, it's like, um, what? What major city in Southern California is named after a black woman? Well, actually, I say, uh, what major city is named after a, uh, a woman, uh, African woman, excuse me. And nobody can really think of what that is, but in actuality, it's Santa Monica. St. Monica was the mother of, um, oh, names are just flying out of my head. Um, Augustine, St. Augustine, okay? 
And um, so St. Monica, St. Augustine, they named what we now know as Santa Monica after her. She was an African woman. Calafia, like I said, the mythical queen. Um, some of the major landlords, the Pico brothers, Andreas and Pio Pico, af directly after the, uh, in the 1850s, right after the American conquest, these two men of African descent were the largest landowners in California. You know, all that area that's, that's Camp Pendleton, Mission Viejo, Rancho Santa Margarita, all that, they owned all that down there. At one time, he also owned most of the San Fernando Valley. He actually sold the majority of his holdings. I think he kept around 10 acres around Mission Hills, but he sold the majority of his holdings in uh, 1868, 69, so he could build the Pico House Hotel on Main Street and it still stands downtown. Matter of fact, I tell people, especially people who come from out of town, I say, you go down, you go down to Rivera Street, enjoy the food and everything, but then go south, south of the bandstand. And if you look, there's a plaque. That plaque is actually the 1790 census for Los Angeles. And it names the original settlers, their ages, how many children, and their race. And once you look at that, you'll realize that over half of the original settlers of Los Angeles were of African descent. And the reason why most of us don't understand the, the African history of California is because we don't know the history of Mexico. At one time, there were actually more enslaved Africans in, Me in Mexico City than there were Spaniards. But see, they don't tell us these stories. The first, the, the, the first um, um, slave uh, uprising in what's now Mexico happened in 1519, 100 years before uh, Jamestown and, and Africans arri arriving in Jamestown. So we have to understand, even when we look at the diaspora, you know, we can't just let borders lock us in. We have to look at, you know, look, Brazil was actually had the largest enslaved population. So there's a, it's a much wider world. I was in Colombia and just met some beautiful Afro-Colombians. They party hard. I thought I was back in New Orleans, okay? So, you know, we, we have to understand, again, we, we go back. What is our true role? What is our place in the world? Where do, are we actually a minority? According to who? Based on what boundaries? You know, we, we have to ask these questions. So these are, those, these are the reasons why I write what I write. Um, my latest article is, is um, called When Compton Was the Citadel of Black Political Power. It's at uh, kcet.org. Uh, there's a series on Compton that some other writers wrote also. But our history, our history and our understanding of ourselves will get better because they don't want us to know the truth. Because we might organize around the truth. You know, I, I am surprised every day because now when most people, you just, you just take that, oh, the crack epidemic was sponsored by the US government under Ronald Reagan's foreign policy. And we just walk with that knowing how that devastated the community. And if we really think about it and understand it, it just didn't fall out the sky. That was Ronald Reagan's foreign policy. He was trying to figure out how to fund the Contras. It's documented. There's a good book on it called, um, uh, well, actually there's a, there's a movie also called um, Kill the Messenger, but the other one is, is Dark Alliance. This is the book uh, by, uh, um, oh man. Gary's last name. Anyway, he's um, the guy who really broke the story on, on the uh, crack cocaine CIA connection. You know, and, and uh, Professor Raw, you know, we, we know what happened during Vietnam in New York with the, with the heroin. Okay. You know, we see on the West Coast, we, 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 figure, we figured out don't stick nothing in your arm. Nobody said nothing about smoking something. Okay, now, and then you have to wonder, how come, how come the black community keeps getting drugged? We know that the coke, 
that the cocaine epidemic actually, not only did it change the politics in the black community, okay, but it changed the culture on the street. We had a culture on the street that, you know, it was like, we all remember the day where we could walk up with these old, what time is it, brother? It's nation time. You know, there was a revolutionary attitude based on just years of watching uh, the news and, see, and seeing uh, Black people who just wanted to vote being beaten down in the street. After years of, of the police shooting folks, okay, kicking in your door, you sleep in bed and they shoot you. I mean, damn, what else can you do? You sleep in bed. They still have. So they had to change that. So we so we get um, movies that glorify the street hustle, that glorify the the uh, you know uh, those that were aligned with the police. And so now we move from a revolutionary, uh, conscious culture to a gangster culture. The gangster gets glorified. And that's and that was the jacket they were they were trying to put on us anyway. Y'all not trying to work for the community. Y'all just a bunch of gangsters. Okay, so they made that happen. So if you look at that, look at how the history of the city of Compton has been maligned. Compton is not known for having the first black uh, uh, black elected mayor, west of the Mississippi. That mayor comes in the office. Like I said, he had he had a majority black city council. All right, majority black uh, uh, board of education. Look here, when when we went to school, and some of y'all sound like y'all went to school with me. In the morning, yeah, we did the pledge of allegiance and everything, but we also sang, lift every voice and sing. You weren't getting that anyplace else. Okay, you got you got black kids now. They they that song they don't even know what it is. We lived in a very special time coming up through Compton. We had teachers who were who were fresh off the battlefield. They were they were coming up from historically black universities and colleges, and they were fresh off the civil rights battlefield. And now they come to a black to a black city and they want to teach these black kids. You know, as I'm coming up through school, I mean, you know, we saw there was no shortage of black male teachers. Okay, and we had, you know, even though I didn't always agree with with uh, uh, Aaron Wade's analysis, because every time something bad happened, he blamed it on black power. Um, but what he showed us is a consistent, strong black man. We used to love to watch the football game because I wanted to see I wanted to see him on the field. Okay, few one of the few one of the few black uh, uh, referees in in an NFL. But we could look at him with pride. We, we're like, yeah, you know, he wasn't he wasn't embarrassing us. He was lifting us up. So I didn't have to agree with everything he said, but I watched what he did. You know, I can think of, of teachers I had at Compton High School, male teachers, Mr. Fowler and others, okay, who not only taught their subject, but cared about you as an individual. We saw that even in our political leaders. I mean, look here. Um, I always tell, tell a story uh, uh, how uh, Mr. Filer, who knew my parents, because uh, I wouldn't go to school on my birthday because in those days, you know, you, you were uh, at school on your birthday, you could get jacked up. So, because um, everybody wanted to give you a lick. I wouldn't have this, so I didn't go to school on my birthday. So I'd be crazy. Anyway, um, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting in this alleyway behind, behind this liquor store over here on Compton and, and Paulson. Um, Matt, no, Matheson, the liquor store is still there. I'm sitting back there with the winos, basically trying to wait for school to pass so I can go home eventually. And who walks up? Mr. Filer. He didn't tell on me, thank goodness, but he kind of put things in perspective, you know, because he explained to me, you know, how, you know, some of these cats that were just sitting there passing this wine around, they didn't have the opportunities that I had right at that moment and that I was about to squander it. I didn't tell him I was just out because of, of my birthday. But uh, you had that, you had that in the neighborhood. You had neighbors and everybody who they saw you, they knew who you were and they would talk to you, you know, so you get your program right. You know, one time um, I had a, 
So I, I was at East Compton over here off of Murr, where that uh, at Murr and Long Beach Boulevard, where that supermarket. And I was I was uh, selling a couple of TVs out the back out of my trunk. And uh, by the time I got home, my mother knew what I was doing. Okay, somebody called her up, and I had to explain, you know, that it might have looked like, you know, the idea was. You know what people do you you i had a friend who would get electronics and everything and um you gave the appearance that this was hot merchandise and and people would buy it okay so we'd ride around and oh pop your trunk your 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 trunk and i got this tv or i got the stereo but in actuality i also had the receipts but um no anyway um so, so a lot of things aren't what they seem to be. But anyway, um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Well, Nick, Bobby, first of all, I want to say again, thank you for being on the show. We're going to uh, definitely, you have a standing invitation to come and share with us on this platform any critical issues or any new books that you bring out. And this will be shown on YouTube and you can, uh, have people watch it. Uh, we're going to get closing remarks or comments from the uh, Brother Hembrick and Machinda and Rasha Key. Then we're going to close out. But I, again, brother, you know, we go back. I mean, we got over a 50 year relationship. And I always admired you. Remember, brother, we, we was doing it at Cal State. And uh, it's just, well, a, you, you know, we were just, we were just following your lead because. <laughs> You, you and uh, Willie Elston and all those cats that came just yeah. before us. Yeah. Because, see, we we had the Upward Bound program from you. And, and when I um, when I was in the ninth grade, we came up to Long Beach State mm -hmm. uh, through uh, Upward Bound. So we'd get an idea what was going on. And I remember walking through there, and I remember the, uh, some of these white cats turning around, talking about, where are all these niggas come from? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, OK, this is where we at, you know? Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. Up. Southern, Southern Orange is, is, is really a part of Orange County, people, because it's, it's the southern part of Long Beach, right on the border of Orange County. Yes, sir. And, uh, and it, it was predominantly white. And if it wasn't for EOP and the struggle of EOP, that gave opportunity for blacks to get in mm -hmm. with the uh, Don Duran, Freddie Davis, and uh, Joe White, and uh, all those that set the temp template for that. But uh, mm -hmm. Joe, Henry, do you have any questions, any uh, closing comments? Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, yeah, when a brother was talking about Compton being the first, you know, black city in California, uh, I guess this other area that I'm speaking of probably wasn't incorporated into a city. I'm speaking about Allenwood. Oh, yes. Um... And also, yeah, you're right. It wasn't incorporated into a city. That is true. And um, you know, you know the um, mysteriously the 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 uh, the what? Well, they had a water issue. Right, they put uh, yeah, Go go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I've been up there twice. My track coach took me there in 1972 on the way to a state track meet. Mm -hmm. and and one of Allensworth's granddaughters was still living there at the time. But since they've, uh, you know, they've turned into a state park and they, mm -hmm. and they, and they uh, uh, renovated the hotel, the general store and all that. Just wanted to mention that. And when you're talking about the, uh, down in Mexico with the, with the slavery freedom thing, I cut, I remember the, trying to remember the brother's name, Gaspar. The brother that led, they got a big statue of him in Mexico City. He got a spear in one hand and, and he got a machete in another hand. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Um, Gaspar or something. Oh man, I'm, uh, I apologize for his name. Uh, if you if you get the um, the notable Southern Californians in Black History book, it's in there. Matter of fact, so is Allensworth and uh, a couple of other things you might find interesting. Matter of fact, I I I, I think that's Colonel Allensworth's picture on the front cover. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is exactly him. You know, he was he was run down in, over in um, Monrovia. Right, about motorcycle. Yeah. Yeah. Two two white uh, guys on a motorcycle. 
Yeah, yeah. They said it was an accident. <laughs> right, right after that, it all fell apart. But it, you know, yeah, it started to. But the the big thing was when the uh, the railroad, because they see they had a stop there at Allensburg. Right. And the railroad moved the stop because the people there they they would not hire any black people to work to work in the station there. And when people uh, protested, they just moved they just moved the station. So that was a blow. And then the last blow, um, according to their original contract, their the company that sold them the land was also supposed to provide uh, water. And they stopped doing that. And the uh, the wells that they had. Uh, all of a sudden became contaminated with uh, arsenic. Right. Yeah. But you know, there was also there was also another agricultural colony over by um, um, right by the Mexican border, Calexico. And if you still go, if you if you go into Calexico today, you know they have a high school named after Frederick Douglass. That population is kind of. I was, was going to mention to the listeners: anybody want to go to Allensburg, the train will, you know, uh, was Amtrak stops about fifty yards away from the actual park itself, so you can get dropped off by the train, visit Allensworth all day, and catch the train on the way back in. They'll, they even have vans that are bringing from the railroad track to the spot and back. They even have full hookups up there. You know, for people got RVs now. <laughs> Check that out. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's some place that people should go to. Is that a doubt? In Juneteenth, they always have a big affair where they dress up in the old garb from back during their time and all that. Anyway, I just want. When, to... Hey, when you when you went, did they have black people doing that, or or did they have uh, the Park Service employees doing that? No, it was black people, I believe. It was yeah, so. Cause... Man, I was just trying to stay cool. It, I tell you up here, around that time, you're at nine o'clock in the morning, it's 100 degrees. <laughs> well, see, the last time I was up there, they didn't have any black docents, so they had all white folks doing it. Uh, so, yeah, that puts a whole different uh, color there. on it. I've been there since like the late 80s. Last yeah. time. But, you know, that's how we easily get misrepresented. Yeah. Do that, do that. All right, bro. Appreciate your message, and uh, I look forward to getting your books. I, I appreciate you, man. I appreciate your interest in the subject. I really do. Rashi Key, you have any comments? Because Machinda signed off. Yeah, I'm just uh, appreciative for all your your work, and I'm looking forward to getting the books and checking them out. And uh, hopefully, you coming back on to talk more. Well, if I get invited, you know, all I'm and all has to do is call me. And I'll, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm going to show up. But check this out. I wanted to ask you, man, when's the last time you talked to your brother, Reggie? I talked to Reggie yesterday. Tell Reggie I said hello, and and, and um, you got my information, man. Give it to him. I will. I will, definitely. All right. And I'll share the video with him also. Yeah, I was uh, talking to uh, um, uh, Debbie. Well, she's Debbie Swan now. She uh, was Heflin. Was Heflin before? Oh, oh, uh, Deborah Heflin. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, let me see which Heflin. Uh... Oh, yeah. okay. Is that uh, you mean Donna? Is it Donna Heflin? Or no, she, no, she, no not Donna. It's, De it's Deborah. Okay, I don't know Deborah too well. I just know because you know we have uh, had a nephew in common. Okay. Yeah, my sister Rwanda uh, had a kid with Dean. Heflin. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so yeah, I don't I don't know her really. I just she, know Diane, David. She came she came out of Compton in 72. Yeah, I don't know Deborah too well. I've seen her before. I don't know her. Okay. Well tell your brother I said hello. And I we'll remember ride ride in that little VM, uh, VW and <laughs> and uh, you know that was one prom night I won't forget anytime soon. So yeah. That's excellent. All right, yeah. well, listen, Bobby. I mean, uh, Robert Johnson, Lee Johnson, <laughs> author, <laughs> historian, and community activist. The next time we're going to talk about your activism. 
You understand? Because you have a rich history and you have deep relationship with some in the Black Power Movement. So we're going to, we're going to invite you again soon. And again, uh, if, when, if you decide that, hey, I, I want to get back on and share some more knowledge, uh, just call me. But I'll be calling you soon because we're supposed to get together and talk about Willowbrook and Watts. I mean, yeah. Willowbrook and um, it was, was it Willowbrook and Watts you was writing about? Yeah, Willow Watts, Brooke. Willowbrook. And, um, and then I wanted to talk to you so we could complete the, uh, that video interview that we were doing with the Compton Historical Society. All right. Yes. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, uh, the brother, well, anyway, he's supposed <laughs> to, <laughs> whenever he calls, I'm ready, but whenever you call, you know, I come, you know, rain, sun, you know, you know how we do it. So again, we want to thank you. Brother Rasha Key, you want to close out and tell us who our guest is? And then uh, Bob, uh, Robert, I'll give you a call a little later this week. Okay, sounds good, man. Uh, and, all right, uh, all right. and And yeah, um, you know, say hello to a Rose for me. And um, oh, you know, no, know, I, I had no there. idea. I I'm gonna no tell idea. her she's on the show and have her pull it up. All right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. She's going, she's going great she in Denver. She's going great in Denver. She, I mean, she's nationally known. She's a national lecturer. I've she's checked out some of her lectures before. I have. Yeah. Yeah. You because know, I think she did something in Boston, and I was out there for uh, for my uh, my wife's play, okay. and uh, and saw that she, that she was. Uh, she was supposed to come out there. I think I missed her by a week or two. Okay, okay, all right. So you, uh, you, uh, you uh, on your books, you're Robert Lee Johnson. Robert right? Lee Johnson, yes, sir. Okay, then I got you. All right, next time we'll have it right. All right, go ahead, Rachel Key, close us out. So we got uh, Catalina Nicole, a <laughs> former colleague of mine, that's coming on on Wednesday, and the topic is minding your business. So she's going to explain that. And it's open to the public. You can join the Zoom meeting right here, right underneath her name and the, and the topic. And okay. And All right. And next, and next Monday, we have Glenn McDonald, a former Boston Celtic, came out of uh, Jefferson High School and uh, went on and won a, a, a championship in the NBA, got a ring, and then went and played in the Philippines. He's going to give us the real deal about what's going on with the racial issues and uh, the international issues uh, that black basketball players and sports figures go through. So hopefully uh, you tune in, all right? Excellent. All right, uh, Conscious Corner, and each one teach one. Everybody have a good evening. All right, then. see you later.